the question I guess I have is, how do you troubleshoot or diagnose a system when every single component is bad? Oh, howdy folks. Just finishing up my lunch. Sorry about that. We're back on this Ford E350 project. It has a few small issues. It's running great. I want to stress that. I've probably put 60 miles on it, started it 40 times. I've had no issues with the engine. However, there are some problems. A couple of them I think are pre-existing problems, you know, before it had this its first issue where it wouldn't start. And then some of them I think are caused by it just sitting for so long. So the speedometer doesn't work correctly. You get above 45 miles an hour and it just starts going crazy. So we're going to look into that. And then I noticed when I was underneath of it that the air conditioning lines are leaking in the same spot down here under the cab where those coolant lines were leaking. So we got to fix that. And yeah, other than that, I think the lights and stuff all work. We got to check the tires and then we're going to finally ship this thing out of here. The speedometer in this truck doesn't work right. Once you get above about 45, maybe around 50 miles an hour, the speedometer starts going crazy. And I'm trying to figure out if it's got a bad speed sensor or if it's something bad with the, the piece on module. So I got my scope set up. It's pretty interesting. I probably won't be able to talk while I'm driving because the wind noise would be so bad. But as soon as this tractor goes by, I'll show you. Okay, the top wave is going to be the speed sensor. The bottom wave is the square wave that's generated by the piece on module. So watch these signals and see what happens when I get up around 55 miles an hour. that is pretty interesting. So the top wave here is the sensor output. That's the speed sensor in the rear axle. So this one has a two wire, you know, magnetic reluctance sensor. So it creates its own little voltage here. And you see the amplitude moves around, but the frequency never changes. However, once we get up around 45 miles an hour, the output from the PSOM module starts to just go crazy and fluctuate pretty wildly in frequency. It doesn't lose the signal entirely, but the frequency just starts changing for no reason. So I'm saying this truck has a bad PSOM. Now here's a wiring diagram for this PSOM system. So PSOM stands for Programmable Speedometer Odometer Module. And it basically allows you to program the speed sensor to work with different size wheels and tires. So what it does is that it takes the AC output from the speed sensor in the axle and it converts it into a square wave signal that it sends out to the PCM and it translates whatever signal it gets from the axle into 8,000 pulses per mile. I think it says that right here. Yeah, 8,000 pulses per mile speed signal output to the PCM. So when I was checking it with the scope, I was measuring between these two wires and from this wire to ground. And you saw what happened. So I don't think we have a problem with the, the axle speed sensor. I think we just have a bad PSOM. And that's a pretty common problem. So. What we're going to do, I think, is find somebody that rebuilds these modules and see if they can either exchange it or rebuild this one. And this module is built into the back of the instrument cluster. It actually attaches to the back of the speedometer, so you'll see that in a minute. I'll show you how I'm hooked up here. So the wire from the PSOM to the PCM comes through this bundle here underneath the dash, and I just tied into that gray with a black stripe wire right there with a the piercing probe. And I did basically the same thing with the two wires from the speed sensor. Just tied into them right here on the frame rail, right next to the transmission. I think we got a caliper hanging up here on the front. And I can smell, I can smell that smell. Something burning. Let me catch you guys up. I tore the dash completely apart and pulled the instrument cluster out. There's the cluster right there on the seat. I took the speedometer unit out of the cluster. There's not much to taking these dashes apart. Just a, a couple words of warning on these old body style Fords. They have 
a couple of trim panels here and there are screws behind those trim panels. Make sure you pull those, those trim panels off and get to those screws. They look like They look like this. They actually so they actually clip in right here at the bottom of the instrument panel. The trucks and vans are pretty much the same that way. Now up here at the top there's some metal clips that I, I think they're actually molded in or pressed into the the plastic bezel. Every single one of these I've ever taken apart was broken, so don't worry about that. It really won't hurt anything. And also the plastic, whatever plastic they make these bezels out of is is super chintzy and cheap and a lot of times they're broken or what happens a lot of times with the trucks especially is <clears throat> on the back side where any of the switches attached to the bezel the the screw bosses will be all broken so you know standard old truck stuff the plastic just it just doesn't last well over here on the electronics bench I've got a couple of speedometer units so on the back side of the speedometer is the PSOM unit. That's your programmable speedometer odometer module. And this thing holds the, the programming basically for your tire size. And it creates the pulse for the speedometer and then it also sends a pulse out to the PCM and the TCM so that it can you know run the transmission and do whatever it needs to do. So all your tire size programming is actually done inside this module itself in the speedometer. Anyway, I tried to find a company that would repair this module. I actually went online and you know did the search on Google and all that. I contacted probably six companies that said that they could repair a piece on module. And I sent emails and made phone calls. No one answered the phone or emailed me back. So I really don't know who you can you can contact to get one of these modules repaired. I, I had no luck at all. So what I actually did is I bought a whole used speedometer unit off of eBay and I stuck it in the truck and tested it. This one does work correctly. So the problem is this unit here has 287,052 miles on it, whereas the, the truck itself actually only has 40,000 miles. So I don't have a way to reprogram it. What I did is I just took the, the little EEPROM chip off the board. This is the EEPROM chip right here that holds your all your calibration and mileage information. I just used this uh, desoldering pump. This is a Heiko 808. This thing is awesome. And I actually removed the chip from the old PSOM module and transplanted it into the replacement PSOM module. So now we have the correct ratio and the correct mileage information stored in this PSOM. And a couple more things to note. These gauges in these Ford clusters actually have a, an oil or fluid inside of them and you cannot store them face down. Well, it probably won't show up on the camera but this one actually has some fluid leaking out of it and it's also pretty rusty on the back. It came out of a junkyard so maybe it got water on it or something I don't know. But we're not going to use the speedometer anyway so it doesn't really matter. So this is the original speedometer it's just a replacement piece on module. Okay, go ahead and put this thing back together. So the speedometer goes in first, I believe. Like so. Make sure everything's clipped in. That's good. Okay, so a couple of notes here. You gotta watch these overlays. I had a truck one time where it looked like the voltmeter wasn't working, like it wasn't charging. And what actually turned out to be the problem was that this little sticker, the overlay here on the, on the cluster, had popped loose and it was actually, it had fallen down and was jamming the, 
the needle so it couldn't actually sweep. So I just put a little bit of super glue underneath the overlay and took care of the problem. But yeah, whatever glue they use on these things, it must dry out over time and, and come loose. You guys ever watch that guy on YouTube? I think it's Jeff Escort LX or something like that. He repairs GM clusters. And he does a good job with it, but he probably spends at least 10 minutes in every video complaining about fingerprints on the lens and people not having the little pointers perfectly aligned. Okay, we're done. Well, I'm pretty confident we have a bad piece on. Uh, however, I'm kind of at the limit of what I can do with my oscilloscope. I don't have enough buffer size to really analyze that waveform. I need to be able to capture, you know, maybe 10 seconds of that waveform and really, really look at where the frequencies don't match up. But it's just not possible with that little hand tech. So I did buy a better scope. We'll talk about that later. However, I figured we better have a look at this speed sensor. So this is the, the vehicle speed sensor. It lives actually in the top of the rear axle. This truck, it kind of has ABS, but not really. These old Ford trucks, they don't really have wheel speed sensors. They use the vehicle speed sensor and then I don't know what else to determine that your brakes are locked up. Anyway, the speed sensor had a bunch of rust jacking underneath of it. I popped the sensor out, cleaned up the top of the axle. However, I noticed that this, this O-ring is in pretty sad shape. And somebody's been here before. This must have been an ongoing issue that they've been trying to fix. Because this pigtail here, both of the little lock tabs were broken off of it. And then it had these butt connectors hooked up to it. So anyway, I tried to find an O-ring for this speed sensor. Couldn't find one. This is, a, this is an OEM part, I believe. It says Ford right on there. Couldn't find the right size O-ring. So I actually ended up just buying a new speed sensor and a new pigtail. So yeah, we're going to end up shotgunning a lot of parts at this, but I don't want that to leak. So I'm going to replace it. Alright, we're going under. Where are you, AC lines? There you are. So here's those AC lines that run underneath the cab. And you see somebody must have put dye in it when they charged it last. And that's what that green color is on this smaller line here. So it's definitely leaking. Probably just rusted through like the like the heater lines. So what we're going to do, I've ordered a block off kit. We're going to take these lines off completely and we'll block them at the first junction. So here's the rear axle and that's the vehicle speed sensor right there. So like I said, I tried to clean that off, but then I found that torn O-ring and that bad pigtail. So I just went ahead and replaced both those parts. They're not that expensive. That's about done. I don't really see anything wrong with these brakes. Looks good. The caliper slides freely. The pads are like brand new. So I'm going to put it back together. All right, I got the old AC lines out. I can try to show you guys how to put the block off kit in. Well, here's the block off kit right here. All it is is these little dead heads that get snapped into the, the push lock fittings, the spring lock fittings. And it comes with new O-rings. This is the manufacturer auto cooling solutions okay here's our hose that comes down here's our little spring lock fitting here's our little block off oh boy. there it is snapped in like so all right, now I gotta do the little guy. Sorry, it's pretty tight down here. Give him a little twist. Come on. Come on. 
All right, you guys are gonna have to move. All right, we're magically done. It's got these little safety locks we can put back on. And figure out which way they go. Other way, Smarty. And I got the same front to back. There's one. There's two. Okay. Now we gotta tie these up so they don't jingle and jangle all the time. Now I've seen a lot of chatter on the internet about these about doing these AC block offs. Guys have theories that it causes the refrigerant to get trapped, it causes the oil to get trapped, that it takes down the performance of the AC system, that it can kill your compressor, etc, etc. I can tell you that I've done a lot of block offs and I've worked on a lot of vehicles that have rear AC block offs. I've never seen any real long term side effects from that. They do, you know, sort of trap oil. You see I got some oil here in this drain pan that I collected out of these lines, but it's not a whole lot more than what you would expect to find in these lines normally. You know, every component of the AC system is going to have oil in it. And anytime you remove one of those components, you're going to get oil with it. Now the question I had is, this vehicle actually has steel AC lines. So normally what you do to block off the AC is they're going to have aluminum lines and you just cut the lines and then you buy an aluminum block off cap. Dorman sells them, you know, SURR, other companies sell the kits to block off these lines. These are 3 8 and 3 quarter lines. It's not a big deal. But I wasn't sure whether or not that would work on a steel line. You know, you get that galvanic corrosion or whatever between steel and aluminum. Now the block off kit that we installed in the spring lock fittings, those are aluminum. So maybe I'm making making a mountain out of a molehill there and I could have just used the regular the regular fittings. I don't know. So if anybody out there knows whether it's kosher to use the aluminum deadhead fittings with these steel lines, let me know. Well, it wouldn't be one of my videos without some wiring repairs. So they want to hook up this trailer hitch. There's a pigtail for it over here. This is it. Once I hook that up, so I don't know what's going on here. This is all wrong. A critter must have chewed on this one. Then we got the classic scotch lock here. And then this is why I don't like these shrink fit connectors, butt connectors. See what happened is they crimped it with the wrong tool. So they crimped it with this style crimper where it indents. And then when they shrunk it down it split open so that's that's basically useless now anyway you know my standard approach we're just gonna start snipping so I won't bore you with the details that's the world's smallest rug kiddo why? that's how dad keeps toads out of his shop is that because there's a hole? yeah because there's a hole in the door seal it's a toad block Yeah, we don't want to catch more toads in the floor drains, do we? Then Dad has to rescue them. Okay, that looks better. I did my typical uninsulated butt connector and adhesive line shrink tube treatment on it. Sorry, I'm on hold right now. You get to listen to the fancy hold music. So, I'm going to tape that up and we should be done back here. Dinner time. I want this truck to be done and out of here. Yeah, it's close. I know. What's wrong with you, pup? Told you there are no mice under that pallet. And stop jumping on people. Yeah, good luck with that. All right, wiring done. Done enough anyway. Looks pretty good, pretty decent. And I picked up a new toy. This is a Weller 6966C. It's actually a heat gun specifically made for wiring. The thing is awesome. It's fantastic for a shrink tube. It has these little attachments for the end. Because a normal heat gun is like massive overkill for heat shrink. 
This thing is sweet. I don't know where, where it's been all my life. Plus, it has this little built-in foot where the motor is. So it'll actually sit without you know, melting itself into the floor. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah? Pretty cool? Hey, I think we should do another live event. Yeah, we should. One of these days. I think your YouTuber should vote and encourage you to do it. Okay. You can do it without me. That's just weird. They'd be happy to talk to you. Nah. Right, pup? I give out all the trade secrets. Yeah, you're not good at keeping secrets. I'm terrible at like secrets. I know. Okay, let's go eat dinner. Okay. Okay, the AC machine has done its thing and the air conditioning works. So I think we're done up here. You guys want to see another bizarre, obscure, specialized tool that I own? Check this thing out. Pretty sure it's made by Lyle. I'll have to look into it. I'll show you what this does. So I'm working on the dual wheels here, checking the tires. And the valve stem is right inside that hole, way back in yonder. But with this tool, I can reach in here and turn the cap off. There it is. It's got this little fancy kind of gripper shape, kind of like those, those, uh, damaged nut sockets. Works pretty good for the plastic ones. Doesn't work as good for the like the brass ones, the you know the chrome plated ones. But yeah, nice little tool for working on dual wheels. And then the other end is for your Schrader valve. So it has both the big and the small one. So if you're working on heavy equipment where it has the larger Schrader valve or like an air conditioning system where it has the large Schrader valves, this will work for that. Then these are the tire pressure gauge and tire filling tool that I use. These are both made by Milton. So they have the straight through design, which is good for dual wheels. These work great for working on trucks. The longer the better. They actually make an even longer one. I should probably get one of those. Man, check out these welds. Wow. That is, uh, that is pretty ugly. There's my finger for a size comparison. They really gobbed it on there. I mean, I'm sure it's not going anywhere, but <laughs> that is not pretty. The other ones don't look quite as bad. Must have been practicing on this one. Well, should we go for a little ride? This thing starts so well. Better than my truck, for sure. Five miles an hour. It's the test. Looks pretty good. Kind of hard to say on these glass smooth Illinois roads. But the way we can tell, I think, is by turning the, ace, the uh, cruise control on. seems to come up and down just a little bit. Make sure we don't plow into this guy. I don't know. Still jumps around there just a little bit. Maybe half a mile an hour. You can kind of hear and feel the cruise control trying to fight that too, so I don't know.
we still have an air gap problem in the sensor or what's going on? Well, I just don't know. It did actually kick me out of cruise control one time. And then the transmission went into some kind of a weird limp mode, I guess, where it shifts real hard. And then a few miles down the road it was fine again. And I ran it in cruise control for another, I don't know, probably five miles. Had no issues at all. So I don't know. You look fancier today. Because I had to go see people. Much fancier than the uh, the paint clothes. I know. They're right there. You don't have shoes on. You can't stand outside. You can't stand in here without shoes on. All right, I got to do some work. You guys are kind of distracting. Excuse me. Rude. Especially you. Hmm. I wanted to measure the air gap, but somehow this is a Lufkin depth mic set, things old as the hills. Somehow I have three zero to one inch rods, including this cool tapered one here, but I don't have a single one to two inch. So something's missing. But don't you worry. Years of field service work means I've ended up with doubles and triples of pretty much everything. So I think I'm making here. This was the go box. Let's see here. Lots of goodies in there. There we go. There we go. That's what we need. So this is a Mitutoyo set. And I probably don't need three depth micrometers, but you know, you never have too many. Hi kiddo, what's up? Nobody talks on phones anymore. You gotta learn how to text. Guess you probably need to learn how to read first. Hey, I'm gonna have pockets. Alright, you guys are still distracting. Here's what I came up with on the air gap for that speed sensor. The service information has a couple of different specs. So the first one I found says anywhere from five to forty-five thousandths. So I think that's what, point one no, point zero one to one millimeter, so a pretty big range. And then there's an old TSB about this speedometer needle bouncing issue, and it says 20 to 15 to 20 thousandths, so that'd be around half a millimeter. Anyway, as far as I can tell, it's around 24 thousandths, so we're just a little bit over the what was in that TSB, but I don't think that's anything to worry about. Usually with the the magnetic reluctance sensors, they're pretty forgiving as far as the air gap goes. Uh, more forgiving than a Hall Effect type sensor anyway. So, I don't think that's the problem. Well folks, you have good days and you have bad days. This is not my finest work. back down. Let's be some crud in the brake shoes over here. Can everybody see that? That is your problem lady. And I'm too stupid to figure it out. What's going on here? We got some rocks in the brakes over here. So there's a few little spots here and there. Uh, we're inside the rear differential, by the way. Yeah, that thing sounds terrible. This is the tone ring or trigger wheel or whatever you want to call it for the vehicle speed sensor. See all this rust and crust and nastiness? So here's my theory. You guys ready for this? So it's only about 60 degrees of the little tone ring here, trigger wheel, 
that's rusted and remember I told you guys this truck was sitting for I think about two and a half years so my theory is that this is the part of the the trigger wheel that was facing up so it was not under the under the oil and remember we had that bad o-ring on the vehicle speed sensor I'm betting that water was running down inside that speed sensor and got on top of this tone ring or maybe it's just from humidity in the atmosphere I mean it's kinda hard to say but the gears themselves are fine it only seemed to affect this this tone ring here so I don't know we can try to clean this up but if there's you know if we end up with too much run out in this tone ring I don't know if it's gonna work so I don't know that did not show up on my scope you know, it looked like a pretty consistent pattern, but it's never going to work with all this crud in here. It just can't. There's no way. So I don't know. I will try to clean this up, I guess with a wire brush or something, and, and we'll go from there. I feel pretty stupid. I should have figured that out. I looked at the tone ring, but I guess when I looked at it, I must have seen the good part. This part must have been towards the bottom, so... That's pretty stupid. Now I know that the piece on module was bad because I put it in my truck and it didn't work. So we're dealing with two separate issues here, but that's an oversight on my part. So I cleaned up that tone ring the best I could. It's not great. This spot here is pretty pitted. Pretty good sized pits there. But that's not the worst spot. That's not good. Here's the big problem right here in this section right here. So I don't know how that's going to work. I kind of think it'll be okay. I mean, I've seen like on, especially on diesel engines where they use the attack signal off of the ring gear on the flywheel you see those where their teeth are completely chewed off of them and they still work fine so I don't know I tried to clean this up but it's just pretty nasty well I don't know I think we're gonna go ahead and put that axle back together I mean it's not it is no small job to replace that trigger wheel the tone ring inside that axle. We're gonna put it back together, we're gonna to cross our fingers, we're gonna hope, hope it works. It's gotta be better than it was. Anyway, we're gonna use some of this Permatex Gear Oil Specialized Formula Gasket Maker. It's supposed to be more resistant to the, the friction modifiers in the gear oil. This is a limited slip differential. So, supposedly, the special magical friction modifying stuff is can be corrosive to regular RTV in the long term. Don't know if that's actually true or not, but I got this stuff so we might as well use it. RTV all smeared around here. Now we gotta put this thing back in place. Hopefully without smearing it everywhere. I should have jacked this thing up. It's a little tight under here. I did clean the bolts up too, by the way. Somebody really hosed this thing down with some undercoating of some kind. The stuff is really thick. Oh, I forgot a bracket. Oh, 
So I think this was probably the ID tag originally, but it's so uh, covered with undercoating that you can't read any, any lettering on it, so no idea what it says. I think this is a Dana 60, but I'm not positive. I'm not a truck axle expert by any means. does have limited slip, which is a good thing, since this is, of course, two-wheel drive. All right, we'll let that sit for a few minutes, maybe an hour, just finger tight, and then we'll come back and torque those down. And then we got to let it sit probably overnight before we can fill it, at least you're supposed to. All right, folks, it's the next morning. We're going to fill the rear axle up with new gear lube. And I tried to look up on service information what oh man I gotta cut the nozzle what kind of oil to use in this axle it was not very helpful it says and I quote use a high quality rear axle oil so I'm using 7590 Because why not? It's a synthetic. Should be pretty good stuff. Also, this is a limited slip differential, so you need to have the friction modifiers for the little clutch packs. This stuff has it already built in, so we shouldn't have to worry about that. So we're going to fill it through the hole here for the speed sensor, because that's a little easier than going through the check port in the side, side of the rear cover. So, see how much of this it takes. I don't really know. I'm guessing about three quarts. Pretty good guess. Took about three and a half quarts. So that's full. Pop our speed sensor back in. Put our speed sensor bolts in. Pigtail. Like so. Well, dang it, I broke my mirror. It's like I succeeded where even the TSA had failed. Seems a little bit better. It's about the same, I think. That sucks. Well, I took a file and just kind of filed down this the bottom side of this flange here a little bit to try to reduce that air gap. See if it helps with our needle. I just I don't know if it's gonna work. That wheel, that trigger wheel might just be in too bad a shape. Also, I noticed that the pinion seal's now leaking, leaving a pretty good puddle on the floor. So, probably the axle wasn't full before, and now that I filled it up to the to the check plug, it's coming out of the pinion seal. So, we're probably going to have to fix that too. I don't know. This is with the cruise control on. It's still doing about the same thing, just like a half mile an hour up and down. And you can feel it trying to fight that. That sucks. Do all that work and it's still not really fixed. <sighs> Alright guys, I think that's enough. This one. This one kind of kicked my butt. It really did. The question I guess I have is, how do you troubleshoot or diagnose a system when every single component is bad? You know, where do you start? That's kind of the, you know, the methodology with a diagnosis is you, you 
check something or you test something and then you can rule it out. You can say, yes, that's fine. We don't need to worry about that anymore. Let's move on to the next component of the system. Well, with this thing, every single component that I checked had a problem. The only part of that, that speed sensor circuit that actually worked was the actual speed sensor itself. The actual original speed sensor, I think, is fine. It's just, it had a bad O-ring, and then it had that goofed up pigtail, and you know, obviously somebody's tried to fix this problem before. I know the PSOM module is bad because I took it out and put it in my own truck, which has the same wiring setup, and it did the same thing. So also, I don't know what to make of that rusted out tone ring. You know, like I said, I think at the beginning of the video, the customer told me that the speedometer was having this fluctuating problem before he had the problem where the engine wouldn't run and the truck sat for so long. So, I don't know, is it two parallel problems? Like it had a problem with the PSOM module and then the rusted out tone ring is just kind of incidental and I tripped over that at the end? I, I really don't know. Anyway, I contacted the local driveline shop. I ordered a pinion seal, a yoke, a shim kit if we need it, the axle seals and a tone ring. They're all going to be coming in sometime next week. So we'll get the truck back, we'll get the leak fixed, we'll replace that tone ring, and we'll see what happens. And like I said, I think I'm at the limit of what I can check with my oscilloscope as far as the, the signal from that, the output signal from that vehicle speed sensor. I mean, I just really didn't see anything that was, that was too awful bad with that, but I think I'm kind of at the limit of the resolution on that scope. So to that end, a little package from AES Wave just arrived. I now own a Pico scope. So when it comes back, we're going to play around with that, and see if we can see a difference between the signal on the bad tone wheel versus the signal on the new tone wheel. Uh, I don't know. I feel like those PSOM modules are just maybe a little bit too sensitive as far as the signal from that PSOM module because, you know, I've worked on like cars where the, the tone ring is built into the CV part of the CV shaft and you know they'll be rusted completely look like something you dug up out of the Titanic and they still work fine so I don't know why why this Ford system is so sensitive but it certainly seems to be so anyway guys thanks for hanging out with me and uh, sticking it out through this repair I don't know what kind of video is going to come out of this I feel like the footage is just going to be all over the place so I will do my best to make it coherent but if it's not I apologize uh, thanks guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.